Hello everyone. Sometime last year, I thought of a video idea, making a 2D sandbox game based off of Geometry Dash assets and the game mechanics. In mid-December, I began work on it, setting a deadline of June 1st to get it done. Now that that day is upon us, I want to talk about the game. I'll start off by saying how to download it, because I know that's what most of you probably care about, then I'll talk about the game for a little bit. Afterwards, I'll finish up by giving a retrospective of working on it, and conclude the video with an announcement. I feel that it should make sense when I say that this game is only available for PC. There are two separate media fire links in the description. If you're on Windows, you can use the first link, which leads you to an executable file that you can use to install the game. If you're using a Mac on the other hand, you'll have to use the second link, because Apple is a bit, uh, special. The download link contains the zip file with the game inside of it. Once it's downloaded, you can just run the game by opening the file and clicking on the game. If you're on Linux, I'm not sure if the first one will work for you, but the second one should. If the past is an indication of the future, then I'm assuming I'll get some comments from people who use devices other than PCs, asking why they can't download it. I apologize if you're unable to play it. However, porting it over to another device would not only be difficult, but it would cut into the time that I could spend making other videos. In the end, I don't think it would be worth the effort nor the time. Lastly, the game is open source. I did make the game with Game Maker, which I'm sure just made some of you cringe. In the description, you can find a third link to a GMZ file which you can use to import the game into Game Maker 1.4, and possibly higher versions as well. I'm also including a README file along with the project to give additional information about downloading it. Although I'm making this open source, I'm warning you that my coding is atrocious. I'm perfectly fine with people expanding on what I've made if they feel like it, but I'd recommend that you just build it from scratch yourself rather than trying to build on my own mess of code. If you want to talk to me about anything related to the game, whether it be a bug you spotted or a question about its source code, then you can either reach me through my business email or through Discord, both of which are on screen right now. Also, I ask that if you download the game, don't leave any comments until you've watched the video through. I know there are a few things you might have to say, but I might address them later on. So, without further ado, let's begin. Now let's talk about the game itself. Loading up the game will take you to the title screen, which looks like this. It contains a scrolling background that I made by combining multiple backgrounds from the game. From here, you can go to your worlds list, from which you have the ability to create a world. During world creation, you are able to choose between 16 different cubes and 10 different death effects. Also, here's a little easter egg I implemented. If you click on the cube in the center, it takes you to a secret 17th cube, which is the one I use in my videos. Once you click the Create button, you will find yourself in a world full of procedurally generated tiles based off of sprites from the original game. The game's controls are pretty simple. You use A and D to move, space to jump, Q to open your inventory, left mouse button to use your current item, and escape to pause the game. Upon opening your inventory, I mean toolbox, you have 15 slots at your disposal, with an additional 6 spots reserved for each shard type. I did my best to model the toolbox after the level editor's UI. You can hover over items to see their description, and you can also move them by dragging them. While you're dragging them, you can either trash them or throw them on the ground. In the second tab, you will find your crafting- well, well actually I need to be original, so um... You will find your reshaping menu. This area of the game is pretty self-explanatory. You can see the recipes for different items by hovering over the slot, and you can make the item by clicking on the square once you have the resources. You'll need to have at least one of the required resources in order to view the item's name and description. The third tab isn't that important yet, so I'll go over it later. In the top of your screen, you also have an HP bar. I tried to model it after the percentage bar from the actual game, which I think is obvious enough. You take damage by hitting spikes, and your health will regenerate if you haven't taken damage for more than 3 seconds. Also, if you die, you see a death screen similar to what you see in Geometry Dash if you have this option enabled. Upon respawning, you won't have lost any items. Okay, so we're done with basic game mechanics. Now let's talk about how you beat the game. I modeled the game around the 5 shards that you're able to collect in Geometry Dash. 
and you'll need all five of them in order to complete the game. The first step to achieving this is to travel leftward to the fire area. You'll likely find spikes in your path, which will do 2 to 6 hit points of damage if you collide with them, so don't. Once you arrive at the fire biome, you will find shards that you can destroy, which look like this. They are your key to rising up in the ranks. Try to collect them while avoiding damage due to spikes or saw blades, because those do even more damage. After you destroy them, shards will regenerate adjacent to fire blocks if you give them enough time. Also, note that you have to have the fire area on screen in order for shard regeneration to work properly. Once you have 30 fire shards, you can make a potion to increase your damage resistance. Now, you are immune to both normal spikes and fire spikes. Then, it takes 50 more shards to make an orange jump orb. This can be used by pressing your spacebar twice, and it is helpful in dodging obstacles. Lastly, you can use 24 fire shards to create a fire pickaxe. Leveling up your pickaxe will allow you to destroy more types of tiles. I feel like this is a good point at which to mention progress. If you pause your game, you can see a bar that gives your progress in a percentage value, just like in Geometry Dash. I'm not going to explain the objectives that increase progress, but just know that it fills up as you complete different areas of the game. After you're done with the fire biome, you should move rightward to the ice biome. It should be a pretty similar experience to the fire biome, but now projectiles move faster and spikes deal more damage, even if you've leveled up your damage resistance. You should then focus on harvesting the ice shards, which should be pretty similar to harvesting the fire shards. Once you've collected enough ice shards, you can make both an ice potion and an ice pickaxe, which work in the same way that their fire variants did, just better. You can also use 50 ice shards to make a blue jump orb, which allows you to toggle gravity if you press space midair while you hold it. After this, you should move on to the poison biome, which is to the right of the ice biome. I won't go over what to do there, because it's much of the same. The important thing is what you get from it. You get a potion and pickaxe as usual, but you also get two additional items. You can make a dash orb, which you can use with your space key to dash for up to 5 seconds. In addition to this, you can make a double speed arrow. While this item is in your inventory, your maximum speed is increased from 7.5 blocks per second to 15 blocks per second. It should be noted that this doesn't change the rate at which you accelerate, it solely increases the maximum speed at which you can travel. Once you're equipped with this epic new gear, the next stop is the Shadow Biome. You'll have to travel across the width of the world to get there, as is found on the world's left border. Once you repeat the same process again, you can make two new items. A 3x speed arrow, which increases your maximum speed to 22.5 blocks per second, and a wrench. The wrench can be used in conjunction with the third toolbox tab to recolor blocks. Simply adjust the color in the third tab, and then use your wrench on a block to recolor it. Once you've done all of this, there's just one location left, the lava biome. Unlike the previous biomes, which have all been on the surface, the lava biome is found underground. In order to find it, head to the center of the world, and then dig straight down. You'll know you found it once you see it. Once you're there, it should be a pretty similar process to the four biomes prior to it but just with a little added difficulty, as usual. A 4x speed arrow is the only special thing, aside from a pickaxe and a potion, that you can make from lava shards. The 4x speed arrow increases your maximum speed to 30 blocks per second. So macro, you might be asking, now that I've done all of that, have I completed the game? And to that I answer, let's talk about bonus shards. Bonus shards occupy the 6th and final spot in your inventory, and some of you might have already acquired some by this point. They function identically to how they work in Geometry Dash, where you have to collect one of each shard in order to earn one bonus shard. In other words, the quantity of bonus shards you have is calculated using the minimum quantity you have of one type. The only difference here is that you can actually spend bonus shards, and doing so will not only eat up your bonus shard total, but it will consume the same amount from each type of shard. Bonus shards are mainly used for endgame loot, you can make an unlimited speed arrow, a jump orb with an infinite number of jumps, a potion that prevents you from taking any damage at all, and most importantly, the bonus pickaxe. You may notice that most of these have some very, er, vibrant animations. I'm not exactly sure how epilepsy works, but I added a setting to reduce the amount of flashing colors just in case. Once you have obtained the bonus pickaxe, you can finally complete the game. 
You do so by digging down with it until you reach this layer of previously impenetrable rock. Now that you have the bonus pickaxe, you can break your way through it, entering the portal and completing the game. After you've done this, you will be taken to the main menu, from which point onward you can re-enter your world if you wish. Although that's it for the gameplay, there are still a few other things I think are worth mentioning. Firstly, the music. I took the music from people who might perceive as well-known artists within the Geometry Dash community. There is a list of the songs I used on screen for people who might want to see them. There were parts of some songs that I thought didn't really work well in the context of a video game soundtrack, so I edited them out, which some observant people might be able to notice. However, considering I solely did it with audacity and without any experience, I actually think it's decently seamless. Talking about music allows me to nicely segue into sound effects. Every sound effect in the game was taken from Geometry Dash. This somewhat limited the amount of sound effects I could use, since Geometry Dash doesn't have that many sound effects, but pitch shifting and distorting some sound effects was enough to make them sound distinct. Also, there were some sound effects that I slowed down and added reverb to to add a greater feeling of accomplishment. The last thing of note is the settings menu. I'm not going to go over every single setting, but I will point out certain ones. First of all, you are able to change the game's resolution, which can sometimes increase the performance. However, doing this can screw with the way that the game scales textures. Unfortunately, I don't really have control over it, and stuff like that is instead handled by the game engine. Also, although a full screen mode does exist, I wouldn't recommend it. On the last page of the settings menu, there is an autosave option that is enabled by default. You have the ability to choose the number of frames between autosaves, and you can also specify whether you want an alert to appear in the bottom left corner of your screen. The reason I brought this setting up is because autosaving works in kind of a weird way. When it comes to tile changes, instead of being saved whenever the game is autosaved, they are saved as soon as they change in the game. Also, because of the way I made the game, the automatic tile saving cannot be turned off. I know some of you can already see the potential for a duplication glitch, but, but please, please do not do that. I, I am watching you. In the past, I made a video saying that Geometry Dash should have GUI scaling and custom key bindings. I feel that people would make fun of me if I went on to not put said features in my own game, so you can alter both of those settings in the settings menu. Keep in mind that key binding doesn't work with mouse inputs, and it only works with the keyboard. I also obviously added volume sliders, but unlike Geometry Dash, these scale logarithmically. Finally, there is also a setting labeled Better Tiles that is on by default. I'd recommend turning this off if you're having lag spikes, because it reduces the amount of calculations required for tile rendering at the expense of them looking nice. I want to wrap up this talking about the game section by saying that I'm sure I'll make changes to the game at some point. In fact, there are some things in the script that were already rendered outdated by the time I'm voicing this. Because of this, there is a fourth link in the description that leads to the game's changelog. It's a PDF document you can open in your browser, and I'll do my best to keep it updated. That was all I had to say about what's included in the game. As mentioned before, I now want to give a retrospective of my work on this project. Even though I was able to get this project done, along with most of the features I wanted to implement, I still experienced a ton of hiccups while making it. What I want to do with this segment is start back in December, then briefly and chronologically talk about my experience making the game. While doing it, I'll also bring up some things I would do differently if I were to do this again. So, when I created the game file, the first thing I worked on was player movement. The movement in this game is a bit more complicated than in games I've made in the past, because it included both acceleration and friction along with the player's base speed. I do remember it taking a bit longer to make than I wanted to, but in hindsight, I feel that player movement was a big success. Although I made it before any other feature, it still worked really well throughout the entire development of the game. I did have to make a few tweaks to accommodate for certain item additions, but other than that, I didn't ever have to think about it again and I'm glad I took the time to get it right. Afterwards, I moved on to making the game's GUI. This didn't go as smoothly as player movement. I began work on it, then realized I was doing it completely wrong, and had to start from scratch. Similar to player movement, the GUI elements I needed to make for it were different from what I was used to, 
so it took a while for me to figure them out. Although I was able to eventually cobble together a system that worked pretty well, it still took way more time than I would have liked it to. Looking back, I wish I had planned better for the creation of GOI and finished it a lot sooner. After that, I moved on to creating the Infinite Toolbox system. Although this took a bit longer than I wanted it to as well, most of the delays can be attributed to GOI related problems, so I guess this somewhat ties into the previous issue. The next thing was tiles. Oh boy. These things were such a pain to make, and they still plague me to this day for reasons I'll get to in a minute. So, at this point, I already had pretty rudimentary tiles programmed into the game. I first made them back when I was making movement, because I needed something to test player collisions with. However, they couldn't be placed, broken, picked up, and they didn't even have a sprite. So, I added in set attributes, and implementing them actually went pretty smoothly. But do you want to know what wasn't so smooth? The game's performance. Apparently running a ton of calculations on every single tile in the world, 60 times a second, takes a bit of a toll on the game's performance. I quickly happened across another mistake I made, attempting to make a sandbox game in Game Maker. For sandbox games to run smoothly, their developers need to optimize the game as much as possible in order to make sure that it's not doing work that it doesn't need to. Although this is true for all types of games, it's especially true in sandbox games due to the number of elements the game needs to keep track of. Because Game Maker is designed for making games that require less complex instructions, trying to do tile optimization in it was slow and painful to say the least. I did end up making a few changes that helped performance, but it comes at the expense of longer loading times, both when you first load the world as well as when you render in tiles for the first time. And on top of that, the game still doesn't run super smoothly. One thing that can help the game run a little more smoothly is lowering the resolution, so I'd recommend that if you're having lag spikes. I also added the better tiles toggle as I mentioned before, so you can try disabling that if you wish. In conclusion, I do apologize for both the lagginess and the long loading screen, but I'm not quite sure how to fix it. By this time, I had spent an ungodly amount of time trying to optimize tile rendering, and I was still pretty unhappy with the results. However, I decided I needed to just forget about it and move on with the game. During my duel with tiles, I did get a few other things done, such as procedural generation, but I still had a lot more work to do. I still needed to add crafting to the game, make a world generation menu, make the settings menu, redo the player's health system, redo the tile damage system, implement tile recoloring, fix game saving, make the game's menu screen, add the game's items, add sound effects, contact Newgrounds artists for music, make backgrounds for the game, create world selection, add progress tracking in, and fix bugs and crashes before I release the game. But I still had time, right? Oh no. Oh no. No, 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 no. Okay, well there's something I would do differently. I wouldn't spend two months trying to fix the same issue. It was now the beginning of April, the deadline was June 1st, and I still had this large pile of stuff to implement. And this was all I had accomplished in the previous three months. And I still had to write, voice, edit, and upload a video before the deadline as well. <sighs> the good thing is, the realization of how much I had screwed myself made something in me snap. I spent April feverishly trying to implement the things I found most crucial to the game, and I posted this to sum up my thoughts. Luckily, the months before had taught me what not to do in making the game, and April went much better in terms of how much I got done. I created a list of certain things I needed to get finished every day, and for the most part, I was actually able to do it. Because of how efficiently I was able to get everything done throughout the month of April, there's not much I have to say about it. By the end of the month, it seemed as if I worked hard in May, I was actually on track for the release date I had set. May was equally successful. I spent the month trying to finish up the game, and by the time the month was halfway over, it was looking pretty good. I then sent the game to some people on Discord to beta test and they caught lots of bugs, gave me suggestions, and helped me to fix some compatibility issues. I then spent the second half of the month bouncing my time between coding and video editing, and once June arrived, that was pretty much it. The video was finished. Even though I was able to finish the game on time, there are still some things about it that I wasn't super happy about. For example, I myself, as well as other people, agree that the game is kind of grindy. I really would have liked to have the time to implement other objectives than simply mining shards, but as stated, I didn't have the time. 
Another thing I would have done if I had the chance was add more enemies to the game, rather than only spikes and saw blades. However, I didn't have time for that either. So overall, there are many things I'd do differently if I were to do this again. Primarily, this was my first time ever creating a sandbox game. I probably should have actually experimented around with the creation of sandbox games at least a little bit before locking myself into a project with a deadline that I publicly announced. There are a few other things I should have done, such as managing my time better or planning ahead, but most of all, most importantly, I shouldn't have tried making a sandbox game in Game Maker. If you're solely here for the video and aren't a regular viewer of this channel, then this announcement probably won't matter to you. For everybody else, here it is. A few months ago, I left a community post announcing that I would be moving on from Geometry Dash after this video. This hasn't changed since then, which makes this my last Geometry Dash video, and it means I'll be moving on to other content in the future. As disappointing as I'm sure this is for lots of you, I feel like this is something that needs to be done for both myself and the continuation of the channel. I'm completely out of Geometry Dash video ideas, and I don't even have any interest in the game anymore. Most importantly, I hope that after I do this, my channel will be able to operate with a lot more freedom and creativity. So, even if you're not that fond of games besides Geometry Dash, I'd still recommend you stay at least a little while to get a taste of my new content, but you're free to do as you choose. So. Thanks for watching all of my Geometry Dash videos, and I'll see you after I make the switch.